finishing off this morning our series of sermons on uh, Stephen's speech. Uh, and as you can see today, we're going to be looking at the aspect of Acts chapter 7 that deals with idols and prophets. Um, so if you'd like to turn to Acts chapter 7, uh, I'm going to be reading from verse 37 to verse 43. And while you're doing that, I'll just go to the Lord in prayer. <coughs> Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord, to share from your word with the people here. Father, I pray that your spirit would take my words, my preaching, and Lord, that uh, you would apply it to people's hearts here, Lord, that uh, your spirit would speak to them, Lord, and that they might uh, receive understanding, Lord, that they might grow in faith, that they might grow in their love for you. Lord, and for, and for one another. I pray, Lord, that it might have a transforming effect upon them, Lord. I pray that it might be spiritual food to those who are gathered here. Lord, I pray that you might teach me this morning as well, Lord. And I, I remain, Father, flexible to if your spirit leads me in a different uh, direction. Lord, I pray you would lead me. And I pray, Lord, that all things would be done here. Lord, as the word says, decently and in order, but that all things also will be done to the glory of God through Jesus Christ in his name. Okay, so we're going to take a look at Acts chapter 7. When we've been looking at this whole series of uh, Stephen's speech, we've been really looking at the history of Israel, haven't we? That's really what Stephen is talking about. <coughs> From, from the beginnings of Israel right up to that present time uh, just after the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and his, and his resurrection. Uh, but what Stephen is doing is he's making Jesus the issue, isn't he? He's making Jesus the fulfillment of all that history. And when we come to approach any doctrine, any theology, uh, even the history of Israel, we do so from what is called... Uh, a pan-canonical approach. You like the, you, pan, you know that word panorama? You know, you, when you go to the top of a really high hill and you say, oh, I went to the top of this hill and I looked out and I had a panoramic view all around me. Was, I could see all the hills, I could see all the horizon and everything. I could just turn around and just see absolutely everything. So a pan-canonical view is we talk of the canon of scripture all the words of the scriptures, all the books of the scripture, and a pan-canonical view takes into account all the scriptures, everything that's written, Old Testament, New Testament, and it brings it all together. And so we talk in terms of context, understanding what the Bible is saying in the context we find it, but we also speak about understanding it in the widest context as well. So, for example, when I want to understand uh, the verses we're looking at here in Acts 7, I look at Acts chapter 7, and I look at the book of Acts, and say, okay, so what, what, what's being said, what's being taught here? But then I also can widen that out and say, so what is he saying in the context of the whole of the New Testament, and then in the whole of the Bible? And we are so blessed that we have all this scripture, 66 books of the Bible, that we can compare all the verses with everything else that's written and understand them. Now Stephen didn't have that, did he? He had the Old Testament scriptures and he also had something else. We touched on it, uh, I think it was last week or a week before. He had uh, apostolic doctrine, he had the teaching of the apostles. So they had taken what Jesus had said and then they had taught it to the church and they had received guidance and teaching from the Holy Spirit. You know, read Acts 15 where they have to decide Jesus isn't there anymore. Well, he's there in spirit. But they can't go and ask Jesus, what shall we do about this? And so they meet together and they pray together. And they, they have this establishing of the doctrine of the church, the apostolic doctrine. That's why Acts chapter 2 says that uh, the early church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, to that foundational uh, doctrine of the early church. So when we come to understand the history of Israel, we look at it not just what happened then, what was it like then, 
We don't just look at you know well, what happened during Isaiah's time. We look at it, what happened then, and how do we understand it through the New Testament? What does the New Testament have to say about the Old Testament scriptures? And that gives us a beautiful, full picture, a pan-canonical view of all the whole counsel of God concerning these matters. Very important that, that we understand that. Okay, so let's have a look at the text itself. Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 and verse 30, uh, 37. Let's start out. Verse uh, 37. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to come down a little way down into verse 37. A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. This is Moses prophesying about the coming of the Lord Jesus. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively or the living oracles uh, to give unto us. To whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again to Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not, or we don't know, what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifice unto the idols, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your God Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. So what Stephen now starts to bring out of the history of Israel is something that's plainly visible to anyone that bothers to read the Old Testament. Verse 40 is a quote from Exodus 32 verse 1. And verse 43 is an allusion to Amos 5 verse 26. So Stephen is not just flinging accusations around, oh you did this and you did that. He's actually quoting from the prophets. He's quoting from the Old Testament, he's saying, look, here's the evidence of what happened in the history of Israel, that they turned to idolatry again and again. One of the major problems that afflicted Israel in the Old Testament, in fact, you might say it may be uh, uh, the major problem, and the reason for God sending his servants, the prophets, to call them back to true worship of God, to call them away from their idolatry and say, no, it's a pure worship, it's a true worship of God that you need. And the first instance here that is cited by Stephen was uh, the worship of the golden calf. You remember, as Moses went to receive the law written by the finger of God on the stone tablets, that the people were actually began to make an idol. Uh, Aaron was involved in this as well. He commanded them to break off their earrings. And out of the gold of those earrings, they made an image. They made an idol, a golden calf. And they began to worship that calf. And they began to say, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. It's dreadful, isn't it? Absolutely unthinkable, appalling. And it says, and the, and the people... They started to drink and then they rose up to play. You know, they, they rose up to commit fornication, all kinds of lewd acts uh, in worship to this idol, to this golden calf. And this idolatry is something that, that uh, again and again in the Old Testament, it consistently and, and it continually characterizes their, their folly, their foolishness. There is an impatience, isn't there, about the children of Israel. When the people saw that Moses delayed, oh, it's taking some time, he's taking his time here. 
We, we, we can't be bothered waiting for it. It's taking too long, this. Do you remember when they, they were stood at the, at the Red Sea and Pharaoh was coming? And they stood there in front of the Red Sea and they said, well, we can't see any way across. Well, maybe we should have turned back to Egypt. Maybe we've made a mistake. There was an impatience about them as a people, wasn't there? They were impatient. They were impatient when they wanted a king. Do you remember? We want a king. We want our own king. There's this impatience that just characterizes them. They had a disregard. They had a, a disdain, you might say. For their leaders, for godly leaders. Uh, as for this Moses, can you hear that in the words? They said, Well, as for this Moses, this Moses? Isn't, isn't, this, the, isn't this the Moses who, who, who rejected the glory of Egypt and came to live amongst them as one of them? Isn't this the Moses who stood up? to the, the greatest power in the world at that time, Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Moses stood on their behalf and said, let my people go. He's the one who suffered all, everything that they suffered, he suffered it with them. Didn't he lead them? Didn't he love them? And yet they say, this, this Moses, we don't know where this guy's gone. They had a disdain and a disregard for Moses. They also had uh, a desire to be like the other uh, polytheistic nations around them. These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Wanted to be like the other nations. They wanted to act like the other nations. And there was a corruption. There was an uncleanness about them. My people have corrupted themselves. There was a hypocrisy there, wasn't there? How dreadful. What an abomination. What a slap in the face to God who had done so much for them and brought them out of the land of Egypt and gave them liberty and freedom. And someone who loved them and was willing to lay his life down for them. But wait a minute. How about you and me? We sometimes impatient. Let me take that back. Are we sometimes impatient with God? Oh, what's God doing? Why is he changing things? I prayed, I prayed so much about it. I even fasted and prayed. But it's not happened. God's not doing anything about my situation. We can be impatient too, can't we? With God. Do we disregard or disdain our leaders sometimes? I don't know what this, this guy's doing. Sometimes with those who lead us and love us, we can be a little bit like the children of Israel. I don't like the way things are going. I don't know what I like what this person said this week. Do we sometimes have a desire to be like other people or non-Christians? Do we sometimes look at the lives of people who are believers and think, well, it's all right for them. They can do what they want. Look at what they're doing. Look at where they're going. And I've got to come to church. And, and I can't do that. I can't live in that way. Is there sometimes an envying, even secretly, of people who are Christians and a desire to be more like them? <coughs> We're tired of being different, trying to be more like the world, gain acceptance. Is there a corruption within us? Or is God always the single pursuit of our hearts? If we're honest, sometimes he isn't the single pursuit of our hearts. Sometimes we're drawn away uh, and enticed by other things. 
Sometimes Egypt uh, doesn't look that bad. <laughs> oh, well, there were some good times there. Maybe it wasn't that bad. And our heart starts to turn away from God. It happens in a subtle way. Are we so very different ourselves from the children of Israel and what they did? William Tyndale, uh, in his introduction to the book of Exodus, said this. Note everything earnestly in the book of Exodus, what he's saying. Note everything earnestly as things pertaining unto thy own heart and soul. Wow. For as God used himself unto them of the Old Testament, even so shall he unto the world's end use himself unto us. In other words, the way that God dealt with them under the Old Testament, what they did and how God responded in the same way God will respond to us. This is one of the great names of the Reformation. He's saying, read that book, read Exodus. Because that tells you how God deals with people. That tells you the folly of mankind, the foolish things that we are drawn aside to. It's a warning for us under the new covenant. Hebrews 3 verse 12 says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from uh, the living God. The children of Israel said, make us gods which shall go before us. And, and they were content with a God of their own invention. Yeah, this will be our God. We'll just have him like this. They were content with a God of their own invention. And so God sent his servants, his prophets, to warn the people and to bring them back to God. Often God sends people today into the church, preachers and people to say, look, you're going away from the Lord. You're going away from God in your practice and your worship and everything. You're going away from the Lord. You need to come back. Don't despise men like that. You know, it's a hard job to do. Those that call, I've made a number of names go through my mind when I say that. But people are calling, there are a handful of people calling God's people back to a purer and a better worship. Calling them back to live and to walk in obedience to God. Value those men. Now, Stephen uses a phrase all the way through this speech when he is referring uh, to the common ancestry of, the, of, of Israel. And uh, the phrase he uses is, our fathers. Our fathers. Okay. Now, in verse 2, he says... Our father, singular, Abraham. Our father, Abraham. Then in verse 11, he says, Our fathers. Verse 12, Our fathers. Verse 19, Our fathers. Verse 39, Our fathers. Verse 44, Our fathers. Do you think he's emphasizing this? Verse 45, our fathers, but then, then he does something very different. <coughs> Let's, I'll, I'll read it to you, okay? So he said, our fathers, all the way through, and then we come to verse, verse 51, and I read to you verse 51 and 52. Now listen and see if you can spot the difference. So get our fathers, our fathers, our fathers, going all the way through all those verses. Verse 51, he says this, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them which showed before <coughs> of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now betrayers and murderers? Anyone notice the difference there? He didn't say our fathers. He suddenly says, your fathers. What's he saying? 
there's a common ancestry that he has uh, with the Jewish council that are facing him, right? They share the same ethnicity, they share the same language, they share the same history, and so on. But now, when he starts to talk about those who persecuted the prophets, when he starts to talk about those who were the enemies of God's people, he, doesn't, he no longer says our fathers, he says your fathers. They're your fathers. Yeah, they shared all these things in common. But he says, these are not my fathers. They are not my ancestors or predecessors. They're yours. It's interesting the way the Bible uses this term, fathers. Because they're fathers and children. Or fathers and sons. And it puts me in mind, do you know uh, in uh, 1 Samuel, in 1 Samuel we read at the beginning, I think it's maybe chapter 2, uh, or chapter 3, we read about Eli, the high priest. And Eli had two sons uh, called Hophni and Phinehas. And they were wicked men. And uh, the Bible, when it describes them, it says that they were sons, sons of Belial. Do you know that, that word? Sons of Belial, literally, sons of the devil, is what it's saying. They're sons of the devil. But hang on a minute, didn't they have, weren't they of the same family of Eli? But weren't they of the same ethnicity as Eli? Didn't they speak the same language as Eli? Weren't they Israelites like Eli? Yes, but they were sons of the devil. Because you see, they had a, a spirit, a different spirit, the spirit of Antichrist. And so you can be of the same ethnicity, you can speak the same language, you can be of the same nationality, you can even be of the same family, and yet you can be not either children of God or sons of Belial, sons of the devil. This is what Stephen is saying. He said, our fathers, our fathers, and, and, they, and when he says our fathers, some of the things he's referring to, <laughs> they did were bad things, but when it comes to actually killing the prophets of God, and persecuting those who have brought the message of God, Stephen says, they're your fathers. They're not my fathers. He will not accept that, that he is of the same spirit uh, that they are. <coughs> what did they do? These fathers. They resisted the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Spirit of God can be uh, resisted. You can harden your heart against the Spirit of God. They persecuted and killed the prophets. And they failed to observe God's moral law. Verse 53, he says, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. That's referring to Mount Sinai. You can do this yourself. I have time to do it this morning. But Psalm 68, verse 17, talks about angels being present when the law was given at Mount Sinai. Okay, so I believe, I believe he's referring to that moral law that God gave. He says, you, you talk so much about the law. Do you remember that was one of the things they were accusing him of? Well, you speak against the law. He says, you haven't kept the law. You haven't kept the moral law. Why? Because you've killed an innocent person, the Lord Jesus Christ. You conspired to have him murdered. Therefore, the law you're talking about, you've broken it. You haven't kept it. They have betrayed and murdered. Their fathers did that. Their fathers betrayed the prophets. They murdered the prophets. And he's saying, and so do you. So do you. You have betrayed and murdered the prophet. Fulfillment of all that type of prophets, the Lord Jesus Christ. The just one, as Stephen uh, refers to him. 
So now Stephen starts to draw a different kind of connection between the old covenant and the new, between Israel's past and Israel present, or present at his time. Having identified himself and Christ Jesus with the patriarchs, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, with Joseph and Moses, now he identifies his accusers with those uh, wicked men in Israel's history. Cain, the murderer, Korah, the rebel, Dathan, the conspirator. Are they God's people? Are they Stephen's fathers? No, they're your fathers, say. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 6 in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 6, verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways, and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Let's just stop there for a minute. Ask for the old paths. Ask for the path that Joshua took. Ask for the path uh, that Abraham took. Ask for the path that those great uh, men of the past walked. Abel, Enoch, uh, Noah, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab. Ask for those paths. Ask for that way and walk in that way. Scripture says, and what shall I more say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David, also of Samuel, and of the prophets, of whom the world was not worthy. A great roll call of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Which way were they walking? Well, according to the Bible, they were walking the way of faith. That's the path that Christians today should walk. They should walk the way of faith. They should ask for the old paths, the old ways. Not, oh, here's some, the Lord's given me some new revelation, some, some, uh, uh, some new doctrine that I'm going to share. I've got a brand new way. No, I want to ask for the old paths, thank you. I don't want your brand new way. I want the old paths. I want the way that's the good way. I want to walk therein. In that way, that's the path that we want. But at the end there, uh, you see at the, at the end of verse 16, Jeremiah 6, 16, it says, But they said, we will not walk therein. This is a problem we've got today with the church in this country. You present the old ways, you present the old paths, you say, this is the way you should walk. And they say, we will not walk there. It doesn't appeal to me. I don't like that. I don't like what you're preaching, what you're saying. It's so different to the world, to society out there. It sounds so intolerant. It sounds so different. I don't want to walk that way. I want, I want to make a God of my own invention. They want to build a golden calf and say, this is the God. This is the God that leads us out of Egypt. They invent their own God, the one that appeals the most to you. The one that's the most like that society out there. The golden calf was the most like the gods of the nations around them, wasn't it? It was an Egyptian God. They made a God that was most like the society that was out there around them. But it wasn't the real God. <coughs> you can fill your churches and you can, you can present any kind of God you want. But if it isn't the real God then that's idolatry. If it isn't the real God, then He's not going to deliver you. So we ask for the old paths, for those ways that those great men and women of the Bible walked, and that's the way that we walk. doesn't matter whether it's popular, fashionable, uh, well-liked, hated, makes no difference. We walk the old paths. That's the way that we walk. The Bible says, if the root 
Be holy, so are the branches. God grafts us in to Israel. But it's faithful Israel. You understand that? We're grafted into faithful Israel. We're grafted into those who walk the paths. We're grafted into those who walk the right way. That's, that's the root. He grafts us in and we'll partake of the root of the fatness of the olive tree. Romans 11, 17. And you're part of this wonderful tree. You're grafted in. This wonderful tree. And as you look across and you see the branches. I tell you what. You won't see the scribes and the Pharisees there. You won't see them as branches. You won't see the Sadducees. You won't see Judas. You won't see Ahab. Why? Because they're broken off. They're broken off. They didn't believe. But the Bible says, Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. And when we looked at it before, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of un. Belief in departing from the living God. Hebrews 3 verse 12. Take care. What did William Tyndale say? Look at Exodus. Read it. Because it's, it applies to you. To your heart. What they failed in, we can fail in. The errors that they made, we can make uh, the same kind of of errors. Jude says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. God destroyed them. They didn't believe. Therefore, let's stand in the ways. Let's stand in those old paths. Let's walk as they walked. In faith, let's walk the way of faith. The Jewish council responded in the way that Stephen has said their fathers responded. I mean, it's ironic, isn't it? He says all this stuff against them, and then it's so dramatic, they, they, they put their hands over their ears, they don't want to hear what he's saying, and having criticised them as being the, the inheritors, the heirs of, of, of murderers, and of people who hate the servants of God, they show it to be true by their actions, by picking up stones and stoning him to death. And as the stones are hitting on him and falling uh, and, and, and bruising his skin and, and no doubt cracking the, his bones, something incredible happens. Heaven opens up and he looks up and he sees the Lord Jesus, doesn't he? He has that amazing just glimpse of heaven uh, as, as, they're, as they're killing him. He looks up. And it says, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And that, that's the thing, isn't it? That's the thing that really tips them over the edge. And verse 6, he says, he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. That's a man of God, isn't it? That's hard. They'd rejected him. They rejected everything he'd said. And now they were unjustly killing him. And he says, lay not this sin to their charge. Forgive them, Lord. But that's not the whole story, is it? 
It, it, it sounds like, well, that's the end then. That's the end of Stephen. That's the end of the influence that he had over people then. That's Stephen's story finished. Well, it's part of the New Testament story, that's true. Written, if you like, in Stephen's own blood. But it's not the end. Because there is another man there, isn't there? Who is watching what is happening to Stephen. Verse 58 says, They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. Soon to become Paul, the Apostle Paul. Isn't that amazing? Watching this man dying for the gospel. And we can only guess as to what impact that had on him and how many times that must have run through his mind when he became a Christian. How many times he might have looked back and thought about that. We don't really know how it affected him. But Stephen did not die in vain. And when you suffer as a Christian, you do not suffer in vain. Whatever it is, and whatever on that whole scale of persecution, whatever it is, if you are persecuted for being a Christian, you are not suffering in vain. There will be, there will be some fruit that will come out of that. You know? You're honouring the Lord Jesus Christ just by standing up for the Word of God, standing up for being a Christian. Don't ever be afraid to suffer for being a Christian. And you may look within yourself and think, well, I haven't got the courage. I haven't got the boldness to suffer. I'm, I'm afraid of that. I don't like being hit or whatever it is. You think, well, I don't think I could, I could do that. But, you know, God will give you the grace at that moment, at that time. You don't get it beforehand. <laughs> you don't, God doesn't say, here it is. All right, well, I'm okay, I can go and suffer persecution now I feel completely ready you never feel ready you know and if you've ever suffered really uh, violent persecution you're not ready for it but the grace of God will come at that time and he will use it to make you a stronger person I go out these days on the uh, preaching the gospel out onto the streets and I am not afraid of any man God, God dealt with that within me I'm not afraid of anything. Fear only the Lord. And that's what God will do. Whatever persecution you suffer, don't be afraid. Never be afraid. But trust the Lord. The opposite of faith is fear in many ways. You know, it's those who fear. They fear what's going to happen to them. That's not trusting in God. Never be afraid, but like Stephen, stand up for the truth. Stand up for that which is right, and God will stand with you. That's right.